Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to invite everyone to take their seats. On behalf of uh, Syracuse University Library, Dean Thorin, who I see is the last to take her seat, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and of course the University Library Associates, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2008-2009 Library Associates Lecture Series. This is the first uh, uh, event of the year. Um, we will be, this will be followed next month by Russ King, who will talk about designing the bird, an architect's tale, uh, a talk about the very building that we're in. For those of you who are not members of Library Associates or who do not know about Library Associates, um, I would encourage you all to visit the Library Associates uh, website, which can be found uh, by way of the University Library's website. There is a link to the Associates page. You can learn more about membership opportunities uh, there. And now I get to, I didn't introduce myself yet, I apologize. I'm Sean Quinby. <laughs> I'm the director of special, the Special Collections Research Center. Uh, here at Syracuse University Library and also the uh, treasurer for our library associates. And it is my job to not only introduce the series, but to introduce our speaker today. Modern American history is replete with tragic dates that force us to pause for a moment and recall where were we on that day. If we're feeling especially reflective, we might wonder who were we on that day. A disproportionate number of these events seem to occur in the 1960s, the assassination of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, for example. In my own lifetime, September 11, 2001 is the first, and I can only hope, the last date to inspire this sort of introspection. These are the types of events that not only affect us personally, but which affect us as a people. There is the sense, real or not, that we are emotionally connected to our fellow citizens, even if just for a moment. Perhaps this is even an essential part of the grieving process. The more cynical among us, like the writer Susan Faludi, charged that collective grieving is an illusion engineered by the powers that be to achieve diabolical ends. While I may not personally agree with this point, I would concur that grieving is invariably a very personal and often a deeply lonely process. Thus, while the September 11th attacks affected us all, our paths toward healing, if we are indeed fortunate enough to have found one, are unique to each of us. The events of September 11th inspired no shortage of artistic responses. As is the nature of art, these responses seek in part to express personal pain while still attempting to connect in a meaningful way with fellow human beings. Werner Pfeiffer's Out of the Sky, Remembering 9-11, is a powerful example of the artistic response to September 11th. Pfeiffer, a master book artist, pairs the conceptual rules of bookness, fluid as they may be, with the raw physicality of sculpture in this tribute to the victims. Pfeiffer was born in 1937 in Stuttgart, Germany, and studied at the Akademie der Bildenden Kunst. How did I how did I do with that? Uh, he emigrated to the United States in 1961 and became a professor of art at the Pratt Institute in New York City in 1969. Pfeiffer's work as a sculptor, printmaker, and painter has been shown in more than 170 group and solo exhibitions worldwide. He now lives along the Hudson River in Red Hook, New York. Today, Werner is going to assemble out of the sky while commenting on the very events that led to its creation. Let's please uh, welcome Werner Pfeiffer. Let me see. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Is, it, is it working? I guess. Thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you for your wonderful introduction. And uh, today is that very day when seven years ago we faced this enormous tragedy. And let me start uh, by a best by reading uh, a text that I wrote to this particular uh, piece. And then I'll explain to you what, uh, what made it, uh, how it happened, how it came into place. Uh, the text I wrote uh, on and off 
from, let's see, the first time I made notations was probably three, four months after the uh, event. And then I stopped and worked on the book itself and then went back to writing a text. And by the time both things were done, you know, I revised the text and, and this is what it really uh, amounts to. Uh, it was early on a Tuesday. The sun was rising against the crisp blue sky in anticipation of a warm September afternoon. By mid-morning, however, the promise of a beautiful day was profoundly altered. Nothing in our recent memory had prepared us for what was about to happen. With a suddenness only hindsight can recall, a meticulously planned attack struck at the architectural marvel of Manhattan's financial district, at the citadel of military power across the Potomac, and at the very heart of our nation. In a coordinated plot, terrorists had hijacked four planes, two out of Boston, one from Newark, and one from Washington, D.C. They used to they used three of this as lethal missiles of fuel, metal, and flesh and blood to slam into targets in New York City in the nation's capital. The fourth plane, United Airlines Flight 93, plunged into a field in southern Pennsylvania, killing everybody on board. In all likelihood, this plane had been aimed at the political leadership either on the, in the White House or on Capitol Hill. Desperate cell phone messages from the doomed flight hinted at the horrendous drama in the sky and confirmed it was only the, passion, the passenger's heroic attempt to wrestle the plane back from the hijackers that, the fought, that foiled this dark mission. In the end, the killers drove the plane deliberately into the ground. Madmen had attacked our country with a ferocity and cunning he could neither imagine nor understand. We stood in disbelief as black plumes darkened the sky. For days and weeks afterwards, television sets held the world transfixed in endless replays of death and destruction. Many of us experienced a deep sense of vulnerability, and with it, a need to look inward. We had to reaffirm our values and to probe for guiding spiritual markers within ourselves. As we watched a swash of death cut through the Pentagon and the collapse of the World Trade Center, life as we knew it seemed to come to an end. Only after the initial shock and pain passed could we grapple with what was happening. All this senseless death, all this mindless destruction. Who could hate us so much? Days later, we, found, we somehow found our footing again. As we rallied around the flag and demanded accountability, slowly we learned that the country had been attacked by a handful of crazed fanatics. Young men in the thrall of misguided religious credo had embarked on a suicide mission of unspeakable dimensions. These young men were encouraged by Osama bin Laden, a zealous hate monger of Saudi origin, messianic sign of a well-known family. He rejected his privileged life and instead turned to preaching a poisonous gospel. Intent on his medieval vision, he employs 21st century technology, which encourages the killing of Western infidels and threatens the fabric of civilized society. In realizing security experts, long-held fears, his small band of terrorists killed thousands of innocent people, shattered the lives of countless families, and undermined our sense of prowess and invincibility. Within days, it became clear that this murderous plot had hatched right under our eyes. After some soul-searching, pious hand-wringing, and a belated tightening of security measures, the country decided to go after the terrorists and to punish whoever offered them sanctuary. With broad encouragement from our allies, we have struck at the terrorist bases only to find that this unconventional enemy is difficult to track down. Without an army or a specific territory, terrorists hide among local cultures, exploit religious animosity, and stoke the discontent and disillusionment of poverty. After some initial successes against this shadowy foe, we have backtracked into unrelated conflicts, and our nation has traded the mantle of self-protection for one of preemptive aggression. By ousting Saddam Hussein, we have succeeded in toppling at one tyrant, only to replace him with a new cast of terrorists. Under pretense of fighting, in the, uh, fighting the attackers of 9-11 in Iraq, 
we have created a new stage of violence, insurgency and lawlessness. Without a clear strategy about our role in this conflict, we are already accountable for the deaths of thousands of Iraqis and GIs. While the mastermind behind the 9-11 attack remains at large, the U.S. has bogged down in an unwinnable conflict in the region. Five years, that's when I did the book, it's seven years now, have passed since that fateful September morning. The rubble of the fallen World Trade Center has been removed, and the place where the Twin Towers once soared into the sky is now known as Ground Zero. The missing gap in the Pentagon has been replaced, and grass has healed the scars where the Flight 93 fell to Earth. Endless commissions have probed the hows and whys of this murderous attack. Amid finger-pointing and tacit acknowledgement of security failures, Political haymakers have nonetheless, nonetheless managed to come out on top. For many of us, life has returned to normal. Terror alerts have become so commonplace they are viewed with bored cynicism. New attacks in Indonesia, Madrid, London or elsewhere rattle our complacency, but not for very long. If we have learned anything from these nightmarish experiences, it is that we are no longer impervious to world events. Terrorism now happens here not only in a far-off country somewhere in the Middle East or in Africa. No longer is there safety in distance. Individuals willing to turn themselves into bombs can travel anywhere and undercut the very concept of a superpower nation. Our options have become more limited. Unquestionably, our trademark reputation as a freewheeling and open society will slowly erode and change into a more suspect, distrustful way of life. Heavy-handed Big Brother tactics are already testing our tolerance about governmental intrusions. In the most undemocratic fashion, any questioning of the governing elite's rhetoric and motives are deemed unpatriotic. A vote for an opposing point of view is seen as abetting the enemy, as endorsing terrorism. This twisted attitude contradicts the very principles of a free and open democracy which these same politicians want to introduce in the conflict area. In the mindset, the, this mindset is certainly not in the spirit of the men, women, and children who perished on 9-11. If anything, we owe it to their memory to pursue a course of unbiased dialogue without being cowed by political expedience. As we enjoy our liberties under greater duress, we revisit our grief for the victims of a tragic September day in 201. Uh, that was the basically the story, the background, and I felt I had to write it down because it, it sort of helped me sort of process the whole tragedy. Uh, at the time when the incident happened, I was very close to the World Trade Center towers. I was on the Brooklyn Bridge, which is about you know three or four blocks, you know, fairly you almost see the shadows hitting the bridge. But I was heading out. I was heading towards Brooklyn. And uh, the only unusual thing I noticed was there was traffic came to a halt on the opposite line, on the opposite lanes going into the city, which I had never seen. So there's an accident, people weave and make their way through, but the traffic stopped, people got out of the car, and everyone looked in the sky, and I just didn't know what happened. So when I got to um, the school, practice school where I was teaching, which is probably a half a mile away, somebody told me, and I went right up to the roof. I mean, I witnessed the second plane slam into the World Trade Center and watched in disbelief how the towers collapsed. It was a, not a question if, but when I would do something to express my horror and anguish about this particular event. Uh, old scars in my life had been um, reopened. I grew up in, uh, war during World War II in, in Germany, and I remembered many times being in air raids and see the world around me disintegrate. Uh, so it was a kind of a process that kept suddenly coming to the surface again. So almost immediately I started making notations how best I would find a format to express my grief and my uh, commemoration of the victims. And being a sculptor and a printmaker, uh, it was really, I made tests in both directions. I made sculptural uh, experiments and a document in a graphic form. Then I said, why does it have to be one or the other? One doesn't cancel out the other. So I decided to play with the idea of making a sculpture as a book or a book as a sculpture. 
And this is how I arrived at this particular piece, which is called Out of the Sky. Um, I started making dozens and dozens and dozens of sketches and notations about what I wanted to say about this event. It was essentially what I wanted to portray is the, the agony, the horror, the, the fear, the frightfulness that people experience that they crash to their death amongst the debris of the building. So it was primarily screaming, eyes open, eyes closed, limbs and building parts that makes this amalgam of what I eventually came up with as a large drawing for a two woodcuts. And the two woodcuts are then wrapped around the structure of the tower. Uh, that was sort of the concept I wanted to, to uh, follow. Uh, the technical side, the establishing of a, of a format, how can I build something architectural that is also stable and at the same time can be collapsed into a box, into a format that you can really uh, call a book and you can fold it and put it back into a shelf. So after lots of trials and errors and going very complicated way, I, ways I can eventually found a solution that uh, uh, is workable, and that's what I will show you in a second. Um, so so this, this is sort of a, a, a process that took me probably on and off three years to, to evolve. You, you, you do something, and then you run into a wall, and you have to stop and do, rethink, and then go back, and you start again. And, and so it's, it's a repetition process, and you read out things. And um, so put a couple months in between, time, space, so you have a perspective. And so after about three years, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And then in the late part of 05, I started seriously putting uh, images together, making specific drawings in, in scale and size, and uh, worked on the uh, total design of the package. And then by the summer of 06, I was ready to produce it, make woodcuts and print it. And this is, this is what happened. Um, as uh, a lot of uh, my books, a lot of my work, not only books, I'm, I'm doing sculptures, paintings, prints. If there's one common theme through all my work, it is a hands-on uh, quality. I, I invite people to touch things, to build with it, to work with it, not to be separate. And this is the same with this book. You actually have to build this thing. And then uh, I call it read it. And you read it with your hands, and you do it by touching it, and it's not a horizontal process in this case, it's a vertical process. I've done similar things with paintings. I use uh, segments of canvas that I sew zippers in, and you can zip and unzip paintings and rearrange them and, and make combinations, make sculpture stuff. When I do prints, I work three-dimensionally. There are 20, 30, 40 layers of paper I carve in. So this is a, a theme, and then people can manipulate those things. So it's a theme that runs throughout my, my uh, creative expression. Uh, and this, this happens here too. Now, specifically, when you, when you look at the book, uh, on, the, uh, on each side is a well that basically holds um, a series of segments that you use to construct this tower. Uh, and in the middle here, there is a um, compartment that has the construction elements. These are basically diagonals that you use to build a stability inside. And I'll show you how this works. Um, the, uh, the wells just came uh, as, a, as a byproduct of storing uh, the material, but it, it fits in the perfect way to build these uh, elements into the tower. And what you see is essentially a, um, a shape that's roughly a cube. And it has a, uh, an image that runs circular around it. So if you look at it, they match on every side. But what they're done, they're, they're done as actually as two woodcuts. Each is about this size. And then the other one is this one. And I, yeah, if you want to come a little closer because you see much more, you can sit on the floor, you can sit on these chairs. Uh, because I will be talking mostly about showing you and explaining what this is. And if you, if you sit closer, you get a bit more of the uh, uh, graphic quality of the power that the piece really has. Uh, so anyway, so each element is constructed in this fashion that there are two images that are seen together and they are seamless in, in, in their imagery, and they are matching together. And in order to um, keep some order 
A, for myself and whoever works with this book, I made, an, on the inside, I made a, a markation, basically a color code, and a line, how things have to be aligned. It's very hard when you, when you see the woodcut in itself, when, when it's unfolded, has, um, uh, is about 36 by 54 inches, and then you cut it down into segments. It's very hard to remember which piece belongs where. So if you have uh, a kind of a registration angle, it's very easy to do that. So anyway, you put this uh, woodcut uh, cube into the well, and then you begin by uh, putting a diagonal. The diagonals are simply two slivers of cardboard that I sliced halfway through so they can be flat. And when you set them up, they fit into uh, exactly the, the diagonal across the cube. And uh, you start deliberately with a half diagonal. So when you build the next, and these pieces are, I had them originally just as dividers between the individual segments so they wouldn't rub off on each other. So they came in perfectly handy as decks to build the next diagonal on top. And this is what you do. You take then the second diagonal, it's a full size. This is exactly the same height as a cube. So what you, what you achieve with this, you have a diagonal element that traverses between two elements. And this continues all the way up. So it becomes a very sturdy piece in itself. Then you do the next, piece, the next segment, which is again the same uh, construction, two woodcuts seen together, and they're all running around, you don't know where it begins, but they're continuous. And all you have to do when you set it up, remember where the color band is and where the top is. And that's how you stack it on top of each other. Then a deck. It also, the deck also helps to shape out the cube a little bit more, give it a little bit more shape. And uh, then the next diagonal next cube and uh, so it goes up as I mentioned I think there are seven elements seven segments that make each tower uh, I don't know why I came with seven it was just a logical number when you do this thing this kind of construction you, you struggle with measurements if it's too large the box gets the big if it's too high I began with a 10 by 10 cube I was up here I couldn't put it together now so so you, you find you have to sort of test your way into it. And uh, this is what happened. So I went smaller, I went much larger, and then finally I came up with this. It's a nine by nine. And don't ask me what, what, why it says have nine by nine. It works perfect. And so uh, this is what, what you discover when you work on those pieces. Uh, little details that you don't plan originally. Uh, and the, the um, structural part seems very simple. But it was one of the hardest things because you, you think you have to do much more sturdy stuff, much more involved. And so this just works. You know, it's simple, it collapses, it's easy to take apart. And um, so it has uh, really worked quite well. Now on the uh, seaming of those pieces, there, there are some things that you, you learn very quickly. When you um, slide paper against paper like these edges here, there's a lot of wear on the inside. There would be possibility that the piece rips, that it comes apart. So I made a model, full-scale model, and I said, this is weak. So I went back to the drawing board and said, aha, type it. Great material comes out of the building industry. It's a, it's a, a fibrous uh, shield that they use to keep the wind out of place. And you cannot tear it. You simply can't. You, you can only, it cuts very easy. But try to tear it, it's almost impossible. And they have several variations. They have a, a glossy one, a soft one. And so I used simply on the inside a strip of Tyvek and the corners, nothing. It's perfect. And it also moves easier. So little pieces, little information uh, details that you just don't know in the beginning, they just come to come to you while you uh, work on this thing. Uh, here we are at number four. And as you can see, the, the imagery there also works vertically. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes a circular and a vertical statement. One. First, I have to do this here. And uh, small again. There's a lot of when you once once you have your idea together. Uh, my process was my problem was to really develop a, a technique. And
in a way to be able to make multiples. Because the investment in time and in material and in, in the whole process, to make one piece, it would be almost you know, impossible to find a, find a client to pay for it. So if you bre break it down and say, instead of making one, I make 50, then I can distribute this. It becomes a more rational way of, of return. Also, I didn't want to just one piece, it ends up in the collection and disappears. When you have 50 pieces out there, it happens everywhere. People look and, you know, I've, I've been just doing a number of lectures and stuff, and people put it up. So there's much more feedback. But in doing that, you have to work with the process of how does it, uh, how is it possible to addition it? Particularly when it's not the typical bound book, when it's a little bit different in, in terms of structure, it's a sculpture, so to speak. And so that took some time to really work out. And, and little, little things like, for instance, round corners. If you have square corners and you try to, foot, fit, fit, try to fit this thing in there, you spend hours and hours fiddling and fiddling, and you can't get it. The round corners just fall in. It's as simple as that, you know. Like, and, and you don't think of those originally. It just happens. But because you, you, you get hit by a problem. And um, again, here's number five. Now, what you begin to see uh, in this tower, which is tower B, uh, the image starts tapering off, and what takes over are all the names of the victims that build the top of each of the towers. And um, I uh, used the technique of using bold typeface and light typeface, or regular, what they call regular typeface, to create kind of a rib structure, because that's replicating what the building had on its outside. If you remember, the towers had kind of a vertical pattern, like a, a washboard, you know, kind of a rib uh, element that ran across it. So, so by simply using a typed uh, distribution, light, dark, light, dark, you could get the same effect or similar effect. See, uh, you're a little off the ground, but it gets more complicated the higher up you go. And I just wanted, wanted to show you, this, this is quite sturdy. When you look at it, you know it, it has because of the of the uh, structural elements that run right here, and uh, with, the, with the platform in the middle, they have a good base to sit on, so they don't really uh, jiggle and you don't lose them. Uh, one more diagonal. This is the last one. And on the type of uh, type elements, the type typographic part, there's a lot of. Uh, testing for them back because I wanted the names to start reading from the top to the bottom. So if you read it, you can go across each cube and they follow alphabetically. And I begin on one edge where I begin with the flights. This was the beginning. The airlines were hijacked. There are four airlines, so on, on, two, on each of the uh, towers there are two airlines mentioned. Uh, that is the beginning of the, of the process. And then I list the crew and I go alphabetically into the victims, and they go around and actually it stops. On the second tower, I pick up where it stops here. And I probably have a total of about roughly half, maybe a little less than half, all the victims that were, uh, that perished, visible. But I suggest that the rest, they simply run behind. That, that's the way I, I conceived it. I calculated that the services would be sufficient to carry all the names. But the principal idea, I tested it out first that I would run the, the names behind it because they confusing, because it would be very, very, very vibrating. So this is a much stronger uh, way of doing it. And then this is simply to keep the cube in its shape. And then you do the same thing on the other side. It's, uh, what you do here is basically um, everything is exactly identical, except I use a different color code. Uh, here it's red, and it's indicated section A and top, and all you do is the same thing. And it, again, you begin with a half diagonal that's, that's set up as, as a beginning structure. It goes in to the bottom, and in the deck, a full diagonal. And 
the next piece. And then again, just remember where the the uh, <coughs> color bar is and which which side is top. And after you've done it a couple of times, it goes quite quicker. Now the the um, the imagery is carved into wood, as I mentioned. And what I did basically, I um, uh, made a, a sketch enlarged to the size that I wanted the towers, the final measurements of, of the piece uh, to be. And then I broke down each tier into two woodcuts. So it's two parts, which is exactly what I showed you earlier this. One woodcut that runs from here to here, and the other one is this. So each tier has two of those going up. So I, I simply cut the blocks very exact and placed them, butted them next to one another, and then traced on top of it. So I used the actual edge of the woodcut as my guideline, and I trim it out, and I cut it. And all I do is I leave a tap on each end so I can glue them together, and that's how you re reassemble it as a, as a, as a composite uh, to make the piece. And uh, I could have probably used uh, linoleum to get a similar effect in terms of black and white. I wanted to have a very high contrast uh, definition. There's no grays in this whole in this whole tragedy. There, there's no gray. It's simply either or. You know. So so this is what I wanted to do in the in the graphic side. It's a black and white thing. And in order to uh, achieve that, I thought either linoleum or wood. I'm basically a person who likes to feel resistance in terms of carving and cutting. So the wood was much more temperamentally suited to, to me. And so I used the birch wood and cut it in wood and uh, to um, eliminate any sense of grain, I used special certain amount of extra ink. Sometimes I ran it twice or even three times. And if you do it on a printing uh, device, they're precisely hitting the same spot. It's a very exacting machine. So you can do the same print two or three times. All dust gets darker. It gets a little fatter. And this is how you get essentially the, the richness and the darkness of, of the pieces. And um, then the next one. And here, the, on the tower A, the woodcut uh, stops a little earlier. It doesn't go as high up. So you see they are, they're not exactly the same, but it, it has slight, slight uh, variation in terms of its progression. So there are a few more. There's one extra tier of names that uh, I have on top of this one. Now, when you do, for instance, uh, the type uh, pieces, type segments that have words and blocks, you have to print it several times because the typography requires different amount of ink and different amount of pressure. So, so some of these pla uh, uh, plates have run uh, two, three, four. And if you count the backside, sometimes six times through the press in order to, to establish what you what you need in order to assemble. <coughs> The last diagonal. This is the last piece on top. So this is how the piece looks when it's all assembled. Then what, what you can do, uh, if it's 
it's displayed, you can, I put a piece of board in the middle so you can essentially uh, put the text part. Now, uh, as a text, as a title, I mean, as a title for the piece, I basically uh, came up with Out of the Sky because everything happened there came from the sky. The aircraft came from the sky. The buildings fell from the sky. And so it was a, a natural to really pick that. Also, the, uh, the tragedy had really three or four parts, you know, when you think of it. Three parts, definitely. There was the Pentagon, there was the flight that ended up in, on, on a, in a field in Pennsylvania, the World Trade Center Towers. But I think, inevitably, the tragedy is symbolized by the towers. There's no question. When we think of this event seven years ago, we think of the World Trade Center Towers. Uh, and then from there we, we expand further into what has happened or what did happen. But that's one of the reasons why I went into basically focusing from the beginning. I wanted to construct an architectural model, an architectural replica of, of the two towers. And <clears throat> this is this is what uh, came about. If you look at the at the imagery, it's uh, building elements like sharp edges. The organic parts, the hands, the arms, the eyes, the screams, uh, flying down, you know, all intertwined, uh, fear, horror. This is, this is basically the tone, this is basically the, the, the content where I wanted to express the, the helplessness and the agony this, this uh, poor victims experienced in their final moments. And uh, the, uh, the typographic part took a little time in organizing because it's, it's very complicated to run uh, rigid material like a, a letter form. You can't squeeze it. You can't make it thinner or thicker like in a computer. It's all done in the letterpress. Everything, the whole thing is essentially printed in letterpress. Uh, so you're, you're working with a kind of an old-fashioned technique and there's, there are certain limits imposed by its history and uh, so you have to jiggle this thing in the right place to make it really do what you want to do. So this took a little time. But uh, all in all, I'm, I'm quite pleased uh, the way the whole thing came together. Uh, the uh, box itself, again, the, when I had my first maquette, my first model, it was a little bigger. The box was this long and much thicker and just everything a half an inch, an inch longer. The diagonals, they go much beyond that. So I had to simply work this out to make it manageable for for bookshelf and to really store it. Uh, I do basically everything. I do the printing, I do the typesetting, I do the binding, and I wrote the text. And so it's, it's essentially a piece that uh, uh, is my own creation all the way through. Uh, one of the things I find uh, very time consuming is the assembly of a piece. Uh, when I, I, I'm pretty much done with all the printing. Every element that needs to be printed is on paper, is done. And it takes me probably almost a week to assemble one book. Because they are, in the binding alone in the box, there are over 200 parts. You know, a little piece of paper, a little piece of cover material, a little linen, and under structure, and the size is very cumbersome when you have the length. The towers have about 80, 40 parts each when you take the two prints and the, the Tyvek pieces. And then things like when you have to go and, and seam a piece together in the end, if you if, let me take one off just to, to show you. Uh, when you. When you have a flat piece, essentially, the last uh, part is to get these two ends together. You have to get this end and this end overlapped and put a strip of tie again. So, so how do I get my hand in there? So this, this was all stuff you, you don't know when you begin. So you, it happens, and then I use some spaces, and eventually you, you find out it, it takes time. You know, it takes a lot. You, it slows you down when you, when you go through that. And um, scoring and cutting the, the, the spaces and all this stuff is a very uh, time involved uh, process. So uh, I don't mind doing it, but it's, it's slow. And uh, so let me just put this back for the time being. On the text part itself, what I did there as a, as a concept for setting it up and printing it, I wanted to get the same sense of coming down, of falling out of the sky. When you look at the title page, it has essentially a bar <laughs> with the gibbs on top, and then everything falls out of that. Uh, it's very full of floating. Uh, you can still read it, and I use some embossment just to keep the words separated. On the text part inside, it's the same thing. 
their columns, they're hanging basically from the top and cascading down, you know, in the same fashion. Uh, so you see it goes page by page, the same technique. And uh, this is all handset type and hand printed on a, on a band of compressor. So essentially, this is how the, the book fell into place and became uh, what it is at this point. And um, I'm, I've done a lot of showing. I've assembled part of probably a little over half. And it still has challenges sometimes. When you do one, it's a little bit more complicated than the other. When you cut a little too much off. And <coughs> so so there, there, there's slightly variation, slight variation. So they're still individual pieces in some ways. And, um, so that's that's how how it uh, came about. Do you have any questions? No. I have the microphone. If anybody, yeah. Anyone wants any ask, ask Does the cover have the same title piece? Does uh, the cover of the box? No, the cover of the box is simply a line on the spine, uh, which we, I can show you when we take it down. When we take it down, you can see it. So it says uh, "Out of the Sky 9/11." It's on on this part and the wider part. Uh, it runs perfectly through the spine. Any? I think Pamela, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wonder how many states, in how many states are copies of, of this work owned? Uh, it's starting to spread. You know, it's, it's all over New England. It's in California. It's in Europe. You know, so it's as far down as Maryland, Delaware, and, and um, what I'm what I'm pleased about is I have found uh, first naturally the more well to do schools by, but then I found schools like, you know, Rutgers, there are, there are state schools, you know, or Yukon, which are state schools, which I like to see because it should be in the in the larger community. Uh, so it's it's collected and it's seen and what but, but the feedback I'm getting that it's a very um, it's a piece that's being taken out a lot by teachers who bring students there and say, Well this this is this is what it was. And I, I guess increasingly uh, with time passing, uh, the memory gets faint, you know, and then the younger generation in five, ten years, they say, what's 9-11? It will happen. No, we keep drumming it up, but there are, there are people who are born after that and go to school, and then, you know, it's, it's like with everything. Like, history has a way of sort of taking its own backseat, and, and so I, that's why I felt I had to basically uh, write down the events, you know, and, and chronicle what happened. Uh, plus the side effects that went around it, and um, but it is it is a, a piece that I I get feedback that a lot of uh, teachers take it out. A lot of librarians I ask, could we look at it? Could we work with it? And also from from a from a structural point of view, a lot of architects kids go in because it's a it's an architectural model you now, so they can see you know how how you, you do stuff from uh, basically a very flimsy material that paper is, and you make a structure that is quite strong, you know. So, so that's part of another dimension, right? Where from, from a design point of view, you know, kids come and, and want to see that. I'm struck by the, uh, the similarity of some of the forms to, uh, to Guernica. I'm just wondering if that was specifically in your mind, or if that, that's just such an iconic piece that... It is, you know, it, it is very difficult to, to... We're always in the shadow of this piece. And it's, it's about the same thing, you know, it's about pain, it's about anguish, it's about war, it's about, you know, and um, where, where if you grow up in, 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 in the art historical sense, you can help having seen that, you, know, you, you just can't, you know. So uh, it's somewhere, I, I, I didn't copy it, it's simply somewhere part of, of the expression, you know, when you, when you, when you do that, that definitely. Excuse me? They're all the animals. Uh, that's right, you know, I, I right, but I, I, there was never any mention in terms of if there were animals in the building or in, anywhere. We know there were children, women, men, but if there were, I'm sure there must be. And Guernica has is definitely a much more broader spectrum of, of horses and animals, and you know, it's part of it. And it's it's different, you know, it's quite a, quite a different look to it, but. Uh, Un unquestionably, you know, it, it deals with the same uh, emotional uh, platform. It's it's agony, it's pain, you know, that you try to really uh, express. So so you, you want if you if you stay within some sort of figurative language, 
inevitably you, you use the similar uh, vocabulary as the question. Yes? I like very much the sense of falling that you have here, that falling into hell or something like that. Right. Um, I wondered if you had, now that you've completed this, would you be thinking of putting it in as an architect or sculptor? Would you think of putting it into some other material, other materials in the uh, I haven't given that any thought because I'm, I'm still so stuck in it. I'm still so working with it, and, and uh, I would probably approach it very differently. You know, there's some there's some uh, marvelous architectural books that I've seen dealing with 9/11. For instance, there's one piece that's a uh, uh, I, I don't know anyone has seen that. It's about maybe four by four inch square, and it's thick cardboard, and there must be about 200 sheets of cardboard, and they're all bound, and inside there are cavities that travel like staircases. And you can open this up and see inside. It's, it's a very, it's a very different. It's all white. There's no color, no, no tone, no tone. And it's, I think it was done by an architect. And it simply shows, you know, the cavities running down. And, and it's a similar feel. So there, there are quite, quite a, a number of artists who have been. You, know, you can't help being touched by this. There's no, no way. This writings, books have been written, songs have been written, and, and poetry, and, and uh, a lot of people have done paintings. And, and I just wanted to do something that's. Uh, uh, multiple and it could be uh, sculptural, it could, it could also be uh, a, a book at the same time. Any other questions? Yeah, um, you know, watching you assemble it, I mean, it was an incredibly logical process. At the same time, you're talking about making sure, trying to get the work out there more, trying to reach more people, trying to keep a memory alive in essence. Would you ever consider a trade edition of this, because it would seem to me that for someone with a die cutter, an offset, you could... If someone would want to do it, I would be very pleased, because I think the more this is out, the more it is distributed, the better it is, you know. Yeah. Definitely, I mean, you think of what, what people do with pop-up books, you know, it's yeah. all hand assembly that we, you know, we use, you know, sorry to say, cheap labor in South America and, and, and have it assembled, but it is, the most prominent book form is the pop-up book in right now. And, and this is so much simple. No, it's, it's structural. It's, right, structure is a very simple thing. So if, if somebody would want to do it, I would certainly say, all right, let's do it. But um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm still, you know, putting it together as a, as a unique, you know, one of a kind. And I think also what I, what, what I found in the feedback I've been getting is what is um, equally powerful is not only the setting up, but it's the taking it down. You know? I'll, I'll show you, I'm going to put it back into its box. Because it, it, it really drives the point home, you know, that this thing actually collapsed. And the box functions almost uh, like, a, like an urn, like a vessel. It just appears in there, and then suddenly you say, that, ah, it's gone, you know, and, and it sort of gives you a jolt, you know, about what has happened. Yes? I was interested in your remark about having a certain number of names. Um, not all of the names are obvious to the eye. Yeah. Are there any actually on the inside, as you may mention? Of no, no, I see. I first, I tested out to print everything on the outside. I see. And then print the woodcut over it. But it became very confusing because you could neither read it, and it, it sort of took the woodcut into a different direction, you know, from itself. So, so what I usually explain is that one should imagine that the entire surface is full of names, and then you put the woodcut over it, and you just what's visible is is the top crown, you know, of the building. And I, I, I think I, I have about uh, about half of them there. And I've had several instances where people come up and say, oh, my brother-in-law was in the building. You know, I would and, be very interested in identifying yeah. the name if you say they're uh, alphabetically. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I had several instances where people came up and they looked for him, they found it, you know, and it's, it's definitely because I went very uh, alphabetically through it. And what I did basically, I, I used not all the Bs, I used a part of the B, so I had a part of the Z, part of the D. Also, I could get all the way to Z. So X, Y, Z, you know, so every, every, every station of the alphabet is basically covered and then it's, it's just go down. And, you know, there, there, are, there are certain names that come back, you know, 20 times, you know, because there are a lot of uh, people of the same origin, you know, uh, ethnic background, the, the names are just <laughs> there. And uh, it's, it's something, I first experimented with the idea of making it smaller. You know, you, I could have made the size, type size, half, the, half of it, but then it, it loses its impact. 
because then it becomes just a gray tone. And I wanted the rib structure to be really an essential part of the piece itself. And uh, so, so you make trade-offs now in what you want to do. Do you have a separate list of the names that do, do yes. appear Yes, see, this is all, this, this material is all available on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a group that published every uh, name of every victim that is there, and, and you can download it. In fact, before I did my piece, uh, right, as I mentioned, I was um, teaching at the time at Pratt Institute, and it'd be about no more than three quarters of a mile from the building, you know, there were the bird, the, the bird flies, just on the other side of the river, and, and you could see the buildings. And I had a class that morning, and naturally we spent all the time on the roof, and, and after a week, you know, when things had sort of stabilized, I, st I asked the kids to do a book, a small, to for themselves to essentially deal with the issue and there was a very nice mixture of, of projects that came about from uh, photographs to um, very abstract lithographs to typographic designs to graphic designs and, and but it was a, was a cathartic process for the kids because some of them had literally uh, watched it from first second from their bedrooms from their from their dorms you know and, and it, it is such a, a powerful, you know, was such a powerful uh, experience. It's, I, I still remember it seven years ago. You know, I mean, from, from the moment it happened to, to the kind of chaos and people's uh, loss, you know, they were just standing there, didn't know what was happening. And uh, so when we did this book, there was sort of, for, me, for myself also, first testing out, you know, what, what I wanted to do myself. And the book I did with the students was a very small thing, but you know we did only uh, a small number of editions. But it, it really uh, had a nice mixture. Now, I remember one student she went on the first, on the second day she went around to all the fire stations and, and, and saw the the agony among the firemen, you know, that had lost colleagues. And another student she did a, a piece that was essentially a, a family, a friend's father was in the building. He survived, but you know what the family did in that day. You know, she documented simply the phone calls around the earth, around the globe. It's all lines, like there must be 500 lines calling from here to there, and, and, and documented what time, how long they talk when they were cut off, and it becomes like this this line drawing. But it's very powerful because at the end it always says called Dorothy, called Bill, you know, and no answer, you know, no, no, no. no. So it was it was very very strong. And, and, uh, and another student, she used, uh, again, names like this and, and superimposed it against the skyline of Manhattan and then simply dropped out the two buildings, no names. The rest of, the, of all Manhattan is all the names. And then we see the two holes where the buildings stood. You know. so, so there were a variety, a variety of, of uh, interesting uh, concepts that the students worked with. And, and, uh, so so I, I was sort of helping to, to really get it out of, the, of their emotions and, Help me a great deal to be able to say, okay, now it's my turn to do what I want myself. Any other questions? I have a question, um, and that has to do with uh, the fact that you've now assembled and disassembled this many, many times. And obviously, the power, the emotional the weight comes in many respects from the assembly and disassembly. So I wonder, after having done this however many times, has your has it changed how you feel about the experience? Have you found any sort of resolution? Uh, it hasn't really changed, you know, but what is interesting, every time you do it, you, you, you do it slightly different, different speed, different, you know, and from a, you feel different. Every time you, 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 uh, you take this thing out, you're in a different set of mind, you know, and, and so, so it has a, a, a specific feedback almost every time. And also the, the the uh, response I get from, from an audience or from a, from a viewer, you know, how they sort of feedback, and it makes me think. And sometimes, you know, uh, as an artist, you, you, you might have had similar experience if you have some of your artists or if you, if you write, you, you do something and you revisit it a number of times and sometimes you say, gee, how did I do that? Well, how come this is, you know, you, you almost think it's outside of you. It's something you have you have really given birth to, and there it is, and then you have to let it be, you know, and, and it, but it still talks to you in, in an interesting way, and, and I think that's, that's uh, what, what I've experienced here. Yeah, any other questions? 
Now let me let me just put it down because that's that's also an interesting aspect. When you when you disassemble it, uh, there are some very very uh, uh, sort of interesting parts that you might wonder. How does it all come back to its shape where you started? Uh, paper has a very interesting uh, capacity. Once you score paper and you bend it, it establishes almost what we call a memory. So if you put it down without pressure and you let go, if you see I put it down on the base of the uh, color bar, the paper falls over to the side where it's supposed to go, and then you just close it. So you don't struggle with it, you don't force it to the other side. And that way it becomes very easy to really bring it back. And, and this, you can see this every time I do that, it's the same thing. And then simply take the, um, the diagonals, they go back into the center part to, uh, uh, and I try to, to uh, put it always back in the same sequence. So when next time you take it out and you want to uh, uh, commemorate the victims again, you simply, it's very easy to find. So you here, take it off, and it just slides all out. And then you put this piece down on the color bar, and let go, and it falls to its side. Right? So, so these are, uh, again, a lot of uh, labor-intensive stages where you have to uh, score these uh, seams at least three times, sometimes four times, twice on the outside, twice on the inside. So the, the memory is really in there, and it, it works. You know, you just, again, put it down until it always goes the same way. It falls back, and then just close it, uh, which, which makes it very... Uh, uh, easy, so it has the same crease, it doesn't break, because it's really uh, embedded into it. As far as you know, has anyone ever used it as a performance? Uh, I don't know yet. Yeah, I, I don't know. That, that's, that's an interesting point. I never, I haven't heard it. I know a lot of people have exhibited it like for uh, it's been in Europe and here in this country, you know, on several occasions. It has been up for two or three months at a time. So it's very sturdy, it's very stable in terms of, the, which is quite, quite intriguing in terms of that it's simply paper. What I use uh, is an acid-free an archival paper, it's called a Stonehenge, uh, that, you know, is supposed to stay clean and, and un, uh, not discolor over a period of time. And um, so it, it really, uh, has sort of done quite well in terms of longevity, and, and if I can speak of longevity in two years, but when it's sitting out in moisture and, and humidity, you know, it's still it's strong. But and I haven't heard that anyone has really done any performance with it, except me, I, I do my, my little dance. <laughs> base of the well, if you, you uh, some of you can see it, I have a graph again how to assemble it because that's uh, usually the, the kind of tricky part to get people to touch it. You know, people always say, Ooh, this is a, a ritual piece of work or an artwork, we, we don't want to touch it. But I want you to touch it, you know, and, and it's maybe um, uh, kind of a step. Once you make that, you know, step over the line, it becomes very easy. So there's, an, in the book itself, as well as in the, in the wilds, there are very clear instructions how to assemble it. Once you have seen it, you, you, you understand it's very, very simple. It's a very uh, sort of straightforward process. And then uh, I use a little ribbon here to keep it in. Actually, I can attest to the foolproof nature of it, having built this book myself. Um, <laughs> and I would certainly invite any of you to come visit us on the sixth floor. Uh, and try your own hand at it. Um, this this happens to be our the Syracuse copy, so um, you don't have to be taking good notes to do it. How many have been created, and do you have a limit on the number? I'm I'm planning to do 52. That's how many I've printed, and I've done uh, 30. So I've 30 are sold, you know. So it's basically it's, I'm I'm very pleased in in the span of a little over two years, you know, it's, it's moving quite well. And what, again, like uh, it's it's a it's a piece 
then I push all by myself. As I said, I'm, I'm writing and binding and printing, and I'm, I'm also selling, so I'm very well, which I enjoy. I'm going to campus and meet the curators. And, and uh, excuse me? Vertical integration. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's something, you know, I think uh, when, you, when you look, there's, there's a, a phenomenon that, that really happens at this point in, in a lot of art schools, among a lot of artists. There's a great interest in handmade books, in artist books. And I think it has to do with the, with the saturation of, of technology we experience on a computer. On the computer you sit and you're, there's no difference if you write a spreadsheet or if you write an essay, if you make a drawing, you know, whatever it is, you sit on a keyboard and you Category because it usually doesn't involve a gallery, it doesn't involve a critic. You know, they are they come afterward. But basically, you 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 are you're doing it on your own. Your your pages on your walls, and that's where you do your thing. And then right, once it's done, then the critics can you know pan it or whatever they want. And I think this is part of the uh, I taught book arts for many many years, right? And, and there was periods where it was slow, but the last 20 years there was an enormous interest. Young, young kids to really uh, investigate, experiment, and find out, you know, old techniques com uh, combined with some of the beautiful stuff that have, you can do with a computer. But, you know, I'm not panning the computer as such totally, but if you if you understand both areas, there's a wonderful merger you can do. So that this is what, what, in, what I still enjoy, you know, there's, you know, when people say 50, how crazy, there are 50 books. But I still, I enjoy the physicality of touching it. It's beginning with flat piece of paper, flat piece of cardboard, suddenly you have a box, suddenly it's lined, suddenly it's covered with linen, and you close it, and most of the time, it closes, and it works. So, Sean, this is available on the sixth floor? It is, yes. Uh, you can come in, you can put it together, and as I said, it's it's pretty foolproof. So I have to admit, I put one of the towel the pieces on backwards. But, <laughs> and I also am thankful that you didn't make it any bigger because we had all about two inches to spare when we right. put it in our exhibition case. So <laughs> no, what is interesting when when I when I go and show this piece to uh, to curators and to collectors and galleries and museums and libraries. Uh, they usually take me in a small room and say, you know, show me your book. I said, well, Where's your floor? I need the floor. What's this guy talking about putting on the floor? And about halfway through, they, they say, oh, I understand now what you're talking about. When it's on the floor, it still comes up to here. You know? So you can't do it on the table, because you have to jump up and down. And sometimes you get involved in all the angles. So uh, it it's should, should be um, manageable, so you can reach it easily. But what is very powerful if you can sit low on it, and then you can sit below the tower, so you can get a sense of you know looking up at it. It's quite quite a, a dramatic uh, sign. And uh, so you, all you do is you piece the thing back in the same fashion. So it goes the same order. Again, let it go. Finds its own place. And the diagonal. Naturally, the, the uh, uh, taking it down goes a bit faster because you don't have to pinpoint things and eyeball it. But what you see when it, when it disappears, it's really uh, quite a strong moment, you know, when, when it's suddenly back in the, in the gray box, you know. What I did in the beginning, uh, you saw me fiddling with a piece of tissue paper. Uh, when you print, with the amount of ink that I work on this piece, uh, it takes forever to dry. So I just wanted to protect the binding a little bit from getting um, 
um, messed up. It's like it probably takes a couple of years before the ink is completely set. And this goes in here. And then in the book, let me just finish that off here. There's a, there's a, anyone wants to have a look, closer look, there's a description of how to build it. And there's a doubling up in the well itself where you can see it. And then back here it says how many copies are printed and what material and, and, and the, the edition size. So it's really a colorful and documenting it. And then it's signed there. And then when you're done, you are putting it back in its uh, book form. You close the short end first. Pulls over. And you take the long end. Pulls over, and there it is. And you asked before what's on the spine. That's what's on the spine. And then I have a, a case that slips out. But it's it's quite I find quite uh, dramatic when you have this thing open. It's all structure, and finally the moment's back. It's back in the sketch. I think you comment about paper having a memory. Yeah, oh yeah. Because you've got all those memories folded into Sure, sure, sure. See, uh, I think they're, they're overlapping symbolisms now. That, uh, you know, this is full of memory. I mean, when you really think of it. And, and what, what I want to do, that you can take this piece and work with it, read it, I call it reading it, setting it up. And then a couple of months later, you go back, re commemorate the victims, you know. Because a particular. Uh, today is, is the seventh anniversary now, so it's it's a it's a very a poignant moment to do, to do that. Uh, any other questions? No, oh, thank you very much. Thanks to Werner, and uh, look forward to seeing all of you next month at Russ King's designing the bird. Thank you. <laughs>